in Buddhism, change is emphasized. First, to unsettle people who think that they can achieve permanence by hanging on to life. And it seems that the preacher is wagging his finger at them and saying, you know, like the Scotch preacher, one day saying to Sunday congregation, preaching on the text, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And what about the rich food you put into your mouths? It is vanity. And the fine raiment you put on your bucks? It is vanity. And all your playing around going to golf instead of coming to the kirk of the Sabbath? is vanity and you'll be spending all your lives devoted to vanity and the last day will come the day of your death and because you've uh, devoted your life to vanity you'll go down to the burning fiery brimstone pits of hell and there you look up and say unto the Lord oh Lord I didn't know it oh Lord I wouldn't have devoted my life to vanity if I'd known it oh Lord and the Lord he'll look down and he'll say unto you out of his infinite mercy well, you know it now. <laughs> <laughs> so all the preachers together, you see, don't cling to this thing. So then, as a result of that, and now I'm going to speak in strictly Buddhist terms, the follower of the way of Buddha seeks deliverance from attachment to the world of change. He seeks nirvana, the state beyond change, which the Buddha called the unborn, the unoriginated, the uncreated, and the unformed. But then you see, what he finds out is that in seeking a state beyond change, Seeking nirvana as something away from samsara, which is the name for the wheel, he is still seeking something permanent. And so there are, in, in, as Buddhism went on, they thought about this a great deal. And this very point was the point of division between the two great schools of Buddhism, which in the south were Theravada, the doctrine of the Thera, the elders, sometimes known disrespectfully as the Hinayana. Yana means a vehicle, a conveyance, a diligence, a, uh, or a ferry boat. This is a Yana. And I live on a ferry boat because um, that's my job. <laughs> then there is the other school of Buddhism called the Mahayana. Maha means great. Hina, little. The great vehicle and the little vehicle. Now, what is this? The Mahayanas say, your little vehicle just gets a few people who are very, very tough ascetics and takes them across the other shore to Nirvana. But the great vehicle shows people that Nirvana is not different from ordinary life. So that when you have reached nirvana, if you think, now I have attained it, now I have succeeded, now I have caught the secret of the universe, and I am at peace, you have only a false peace. You have become a stone Buddha. You have a new illusion of the changeless. So it is said that such a person is a Pratyeka Buddha. 
That means private Buddha. I've got it all for myself. And in contrast with this kind of Pratyeka Buddha who gains Nirvana and stays there, the Mahayanists use the word Bodhisattva. Sattva means uh, essential principle, Bodhi awakening. A person whose essential being is awakened. The word used to mean junior Buddha, someone on the way to becoming a Buddha. But in the course of time, it came to mean someone who had attained Buddhahood, who had reached Nirvana, but who returns into everyday life to deliver all other beings. This is the popular idea of a bodhisattva, a savior. And so in the popular Buddhism of Tibet and China and Japan, people worship the bodhisattvas, the great bodhisattvas, as saviors. Say the hermaphroditic Kuan Yin. People love Kuan Yin because she, he, she, she, he could be a Buddha but has come back into the world to save all beings. The Japanese call he, she, Kanon. And they have in Kyoto an image of Kanon with 1,000 arms radiating like a great aureole all round this great golden figure. And these 1,000 arms are 1,000 different ways of rescuing beings from ignorance. Kanon is a funny thing. I remember one night when I suddenly realized that Kanon was incarnate in the whole city of Kyoto. That this whole city was Kanon. That the police department, the taxi drivers, the fire department, the mayor and corporation, the shopkeepers, in so far as this whole city was a collaborate effort to sustain human life, however bumbling, however inefficient, however corrupt, it was still a manifestation of Kanon with its thousand arms, all working independently, and yet one. So they revere those bodhisattvas as the saviors who've come back into the world to deliver all beings. But there is a more esoteric interpretation of this. The bodhisattva returns into the world. That means he has discovered that you don't have to go anywhere to find nirvana. Nirvana is where you are provided you don't object to it. Change, and everything is changed, nothing can be held on to. To the degree that you go with a stream, you see, you are still. You're flowing with it. But to the degree you resist the stream, then you notice that the current is rushing past you and fighting with you. So swim with it. Go with it. And you're there. You're at rest. And this is, of course, particularly true when it comes to those moments when life really seems to be going to take us away and the stream of change is going to swallow us completely. The moment of death. And we think, oh, oh, this is it. This is the end. And so at death we withdraw. Say, no, 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 not that, not, not, not yet, please. But actually, the whole problem is uh, that there really is no other problem for human beings than to go over that waterfall when it comes. Just as you go over any other waterfall, just as you go on from day to day, just as you go to sleep at night, be absolutely willing to die. Now, I'm not preaching. 
I'm not saying you ought to be willing to die and that you should um, muscle up your courage and somehow put on a good front when the, when the terrible thing comes. That's not the idea at all. The point is that you can only die well if you understand this system of waves. If you understand that your disappearance as the form in which you think you are you, your disappearance as this particular organism is simply seasonal. That uh, you are just as much the dark space beyond death as you are the light interval called life. These are just two sides of you. Because you is the total wave. See, you can't have half a wave. Nobody ever saw waves which just had crests. No troughs. So you can't have half a human being who is born but doesn't die. Half a thing. That would be only half a thing. But the propagation of vibrations, and life is vibration, it simply goes on and on, but its cycles are long cycles and short cycles. Space, you see, is not just nothing. If I could magnify my hand to an enormous degree so that you could see all the molecules in it, I don't know how far apart they would be, but it seems to me they would be something like tennis balls uh, in a very, very large space. And you'd look when I move my hand like this and say, for God's sake, look at all those tennis balls. They're all going together. Crazy. And there are no strings tying them together. Isn't that queer? No, but the space going with them. And space is a function of, or it's an inseparable aspect of, whatever solids are in the space. That is the clue, probably, to what we mean by gravity. We don't know yet. So in the same way, when those marvelous sandpipers come around here, the little ones, while they're in the air flying, they have one mind. They move all together. When they alight on the mud, they become individuals and they go picking around for worms or something. But one click of the fingers and all those things are going zip into the air. They don't seem to have a leader because they don't follow when they turn. They all turn together and go off in another direction. Amazing but they're like the molecules in my hand. So then, you see, here's the principle. When you don't resist change, I mean over-resist. I don't mean being flabby. When you don't resist change, you see that the changing world, which disappears like smoke, is no different from the nirvana world. Nirvana, as I said, means breathe out. Let go of the breath. So in the same way, don't resist change. It's all the same principle. So the Bodhisattva saves all beings. Not by preaching sermons to them, but by showing them that they are delivered, they are liberated by the very fact of not being able to stop changing. You can't hang on to yourself. You don't have to try not to hang on to yourself. It can't be done. And that is salvation. Memento mori. Be mindful of death. Gurdjieff says in uh, one of his books that the most important thing for anyone to realize is that you and all you every person you see will soon be dead. 
So it sounds so gloomy to us because we have devised a culture fundamentally resisting death. I love the story of a conversation at an English country house at a dinner party where the hostess started up the question of death and asked the various guests what they thought was going to happen to them when they die. And some thought about reincarnation, and others thought about various kinds of uh, uh, different planes of being, and others thought they were going to be annihilated. But all, n none of the guests had answered except Sir Roderick, who was a kind of a military type, but a very devout pillar of the Church of England. He was the church warden chief of the vestry in the local country parish. And the lady said, Sir Roderick, you haven't said a word. What do you think is going to happen to you when you die? Oh, he said, I am perfectly certain that I shall go to heaven and enjoy everlasting bliss, but I wish you wouldn't indulge in such a depressing conversation. <laughs> <laughs> It's true, isn't it? Uh, death in the Western world is a real problem. We hush it up. We pretend it hasn't happened. Our morticians, who are very smart commercial operators, know exactly what's expected of them. And they make death just awful by pretending it doesn't happen. See what happens. You go to a hospital and you're at the end. You've got terminal cancer. And all your friends come around and they wear false smiles and they say, cheer up, you'll be all right. <laughs> uh, in a few days from now you'll be back home and we'll We'll go out for a picnic again. <laughs> the doctors have their bedside man. You see, a doctor is absolutely helpless with a terminal case because he's a, a doctor is, by social definition, a healer. And he's not allowed to help you die. He's out of role. Even though, I mean, he may sneak behind the rules and do it, but, but he's bad, definitely, he's got to heal you. So he's going to keep you indefinitely on the end of tubes and all kinds of things while... There's a certain grave demeanor to all this, and all the nurses are so pleasant and so totally distant because they know this is death. And they may be frank with you. That's why they feel distant. It's not that they're not concerned. It's not that they're heartless people, but that they just don't know how to be frank. Like lots of people, when they meet a drunk, they don't know what to do with a drunk uh, because uh, he's, not he's not behaving or not behaving right. And so... <laughs> When you're dying, you're not behaving right. You're supposed to live. <laughs> See, so we don't know what to do with a dying person. We don't get around that person and say, listen now, listen man, listen, I've got the news for you. You're going to die. <laughs> and this is going to be great. <laughs> Look, no more responsibilities. Don't have to pay those bills anymore. <laughs> don't have to worry about anything. You're going to just die. And let's go out with a bang. <laughs> let's have a party, see? We'll, 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 we'll put some, uh, some of that morphine in you so that you won't hurt too much. But we we're going to prop you up in bed and we're going to bring all our friends around and we're going to have champagne. And you're going to, you're going to die at the end of it, see? <laughs> and it's going to be just marvelous. It's like being born, see? They, when we had birth problems, see? All women used to think that birth had to be painful. It was good for them. It was one of the things you had to suffer because you'd been, you'd been screwing around with people and therefore you, <laughs> you had to have a child and it's got to hurt. And uh, then the doctors got together and they scratched their heads and the man called Grantley Dick Reed said, no, birth doesn't hurt, it's natural. You know, all we've got to do is to talk these women into the idea that it doesn't hurt, that all these so-called pains are just tensions and that uh, birth is great. It's not a disease. It's not really something you ought to go to hospital for. Because you associate hospitals with diseases. 
and sickness. Birth isn't sickness. All right. Now let's do some new thinking. What about death? Is death sickness? Or is it a healthy natural event like being born? Of course it is. So, I mean, a little change in social attitude about this will fortify everybody else. I mean, I'm, if I'm alone and all my relatives are going, mmm, kind of <laughs> pretending to me it's going to be hard for me, I've got to challenge the whole bunch of them and get my dander up and say, listen, damn you, I don't want all this thing around here. You've got to take a different attitude about my death. Well, that's hard. But if everybody helps me, and we do, we are all one body, they all come around and say, congratulations, you're going to die. <laughs> Liberation. Liberation now, you see. Because just before you die, I mean, look, I know very well a skillful priest handling a person dying can do this for them. But he has to talk very, very, very straight. And he has to say, listen, these doctors, uh, you don't, don't you pay any attention to them. They're trying to amuse you and deceive you. You're going to die. This isn't terrible. But it's just going to be the end of you as a system of memories. And so you've got a great chance right now before it happens to let go of everything. Because you know it's going to go and it is going to help you. It's going to help you let go of everything. So if you have any possessions left, give them away. Give everything away. And uh, if you have anything to say that is, you felt that you ought to say before you die and that you're kind of hanging on to and it's bothering you, say it. I mean, I don't mean necessarily a last confession, but say it said that Adlai Stevenson, shortly before he died, said that uh, he had been making a monkey of himself because he didn't agree with the government's policy about something or other. You know, he had to get that off his chest because he had a little thought in the back of his mind that things were catching up with him. You see? So the moment comes when this thing called death has to be taken completely, not as some ghastly accident, something that uh, all your friends are going to stay away because you're awful. I mean, sometimes people, when they die, are in a very unpleasant physical condition. They don't smell good, they don't look good, uh, and so on. But an enormous amount can be done with scientific methods to make things reasonably tidy from a purely sensory point of view. But the main thing is the attitude that death is as positive as birth and should be a matter for rejoicing because death is the symbol of the liberation. There is a wonderful saying that Ananda Kumaraswamy used to quote I pray that death will not come and find me still unannihilate. In other words, that man dies happy if there is no one to die. In other words, if the ego has disappeared before death caught up with it. But you see, the knowledge of death helps the ego to disappear because it tells you you can't hang on. So what we need uh, if, if we're going to have a, a good religion around, that's one of the places where it can start. Having, I don't know, well, nowadays I suppose they'd call it the institution for creative dying. <laughs> <laughs> but something like that. And uh, you can have, you can have... Uh, one department where you can have champagne cocktail party to die with. Another department where you can have glorious religious rituals and priests and things like that. Another department where you can have uh, psychedelic drugs. Another department where you can have uh, special kinds of music. Uh, anything, you know. All, all, all these arrangements will be provided for in a hospital for uh, delightful dying. Uh, but that's the thing, to go out with a bang instead of a whimper. I was talking a great deal yesterday afternoon about the Buddhist attitude to change, to death, to the transience of the world. And we're showing that preachers of all kinds stir people up in the beginning by alarming them about change. 
That's like somebody, you know, actually raising an alarm, uh, just in the same way as if I want to pay you a visit, I ring the doorbell. And then we can come in and I don't need to raise an alarm anymore. <laughs> so, uh, in the same way, it sounds terrible, you see, that everything is going to die and pass away, and uh, here you are, thinking that happiness, sanity, and security consist in clinging on to things which can't be clung to, and in, in any case, there isn't anybody to cling to them. And the whole thing is a weaving of smoke. So, that's the uh, initial standpoint, but... As soon as you really discover this and you stop clinging to change, then everything is quite different. It becomes amazing. And not only do all your senses become more wide awake, not only do you feel almost that you're walking on air, but you see, finally, that there is no duality, no difference between the ordinary world and the nirvana world. They're the same world, but what makes the difference is the point of view. And, of course, if you keep identifying yourself with some sort of stable entity that sits and watches the world go by. You don't acknowledge your union, your inseparability from everything else that there is. You go by with all the rest of the things, but if you insist on trying to take a permanent stand, on trying to be a permanent witness of the flux, then it grates against you and you feel very uncomfortable. But it is a fundamental feeling in most of us that we are such witnesses. We feel that behind the stream of our thoughts, of our feelings and our experiences, there is something which is the thinker, the feeler and the experiencer not recognizing that that is itself a thought, feeling, or experience, and it belongs within and not outside the changing panorama of experience. It's what you call a cue signal. In other words, when you telephone and your telephone conversation is being tape recorded, it's uh, the law that there shall be a beep every so many seconds. And that beep cues you in to the f fact that this conversation is recorded. So in a very similar way, in our everyday experience, there's a beep which tells us this is a continuous experience, which is mine. Beep. <laughs> in the same way, for example... Uh, it is a cue signal when a composer uh, arranges some music and he keeps in it a recurrent theme. But he makes many variations on it. Or more subtle still, he keeps within it a consistent style. So you know that it's Mozart all the way along because it sounds like Mozart. But there isn't, as it were, a constant noise going all the way through to tell you it's continuous, although in Hindu music they do have something called the drone. There is uh, behind all the drums and every kind of singing, something that goes and it always sounds the note which is the tonic of the scale being used. Uh, but in Hindu music, that drone represents the eternal self, the Brahman, behind all the changing forms of nature. But that's only a symbol. And to find out what is eternal, 
Uh, you can't make an image of it, you can't hold on to it. And so it's psychologically more conducive to liberation to remember that the thinker or the feeler or the experiencer and the experiences are all together, they're all one. But if out of anxiety uh, you try to stabilize, keep permanent the separate observer, you are in for conflict. Of course, the separate observer, the thinker of the thoughts, is an abstraction which we create out of memory. We think of the self, the ego, rather, as a repository of memories, a kind of uh, safety deposit box or record or filing cabinet place where all our experiences are stored. Now, that's not a very good idea. It's more that memory is a dynamic system, not a storage system. It's a repetition of rhythms. And uh, these rhythms are all part and parcel of the ongoing flow of present experience. In other words, first of all, how do you distinguish between something known now and a memory? Actually, you don't know anything at all until you remember it. Because if something happens that is purely instantaneous, if a light flashes, or uh, to be more accurate, if there is a flash lasting only one millionth of a second, you probably wouldn't really experience it. Because it wouldn't give you enough time to remember it. We say in customary speech, well, it has to make an impression. So in a way, all present knowledge is memory. Because you look at something, and uh, for a while, the uh, rods and cones in your retina respond to that, and they, go, they do their stuff, jiggle, jiggle, jiggle. It's all vibration. And so, as, as you look at things, they set up a series of echoes in your brain. And these echoes keep reverberating, because the brain is very complicated. First of all, everything you know is remembered. But there is a way in which we distinguish between seeing somebody here now and the memory of having seen somebody else who is not here now, but whom you did see in the past, and you know perfectly well when you remember that other person's face, it's not an experience of the person being here. How is this? Because memory signals have a different cue attached to them than present time signals. They come on a different kind of vibration. Sometimes, however, the wiring gets mixed up and present experiences come to us with a memory cue attached to them. And then we have what is called a déjà vu experience. We are quite sure we've experienced this thing before. But the problem is that we don't see, and don't ordinarily recognize, is that although memory is a series of signals with a special kind of cue attached to them so that we don't confuse them with present experience. They are actually all part of the same thing as present experience. They are all part of this constantly flowing life process and there is no separate witness standing aside from the process, watching it go by. You're all involved in it. Now, accepting that, you see, Going with that, although at first it sounds like the knell of doom, 
is if you don't clutch it anymore. Splendid. That's why I said that death should be an occasion for a great celebration. That people should say, happy death to you. Uh, and always uh, surround death with joyous rites because this is the opportunity for the greatest of all experiences when you can finally let go because you know there's nothing else to do. There was a kamikaze pilot who escaped because uh, his, his plane uh, that he was uh, flying at an American aircraft carrier went wrong. And he landed in the water instead of hitting the plane. So he survived. But he said afterwards that uh, he had the most extraordinary state of exaltation. It wasn't a kind of patriotic ecstasy. But the very thought that in a moment he would cease to exist, that he would just be gone, for some mysterious reason that he couldn't understand, made him feel absolutely like a god. Well then, in Buddhist philosophy... This, a sort of annihilation of oneself, this acceptance of change is the doctrine of the world as the void. This doctrine did not emerge very clearly, very prominently in Buddhism until quite a while after Gotama the Buddha had lived. We begin to find this, though, becoming prominent about the year 100 B.C. And by 200 A.D., it had reached its peak. And it, it was developed by the Mahayana Buddhists. And uh, it, it is the doctrine of a whole class of literature which goes by this complex name... Pragna Paramita. Now, Pragna means wisdom. Paramita, for crossing over, for going beyond. There is a small Pragna Paramita Sutra, a big Pragna Paramita Sutra, and then there's a little short summary of the whole thing called the Hridaya, or Heart Sutra. And that is recited by Buddhists all over northern Asia, Tibet, China, and Japan. And uh, it contains the saying, that which is void is precisely the world of form. That which is form is precisely the void. Form is emptiness, emptiness is form, so on. Um, and it elaborates on this theme. It's very short, but it's always chanted at important Buddhist ceremonies. And so it is supposed by scholars of all kinds who uh, have a missionary background that the Buddhists are nihilists, that they teach that the world is really nothing. There isn't anything, and that there seems to be something is purely an illusion. But, of course, this philosophy is much more subtle than that. The main person who was responsible for developing and maturing this philosophy was Nagarjuna. And he lived about 200 A.D. One of the most astonishing minds that the human race has ever produced. And the name of Nagarjuna's school of thought is Madhyamika, which means, really, the doctrine of the, of the middle way but it's sometimes also called the doctrine of emptiness or shunyavada from the basic word shunya or sometimes uh, shunya has ta added on the end and that ta means ness, emptiness. Well then, emptiness means essentially transience. That's the first thing it means. Nothing to grasp, nothing permanent, nothing to hold on to. But it means this with special reference to ideas of reality, ideas of God, ideas of the self, 
the Brahman, anything you like. What it means is that reality escapes all concepts. If you say there is a God, that's a concept. If you say there is no God, that's a concept. And Nagarjuna is saying that always your concepts will prove to be attempts to catch water in a sieve or wrap it up in a parcel. So he invented a method of teaching Buddhism which was an extension of the dialectic method that the Buddha himself first used and this became uh, the great way of studying especially at the University of Nalanda which uh, has been re-established in modern times but of course it was destroyed by the Muslims when they invaded India the University of Nalanda where the dialectic method of enlightenment was taught. The dialectic method is perfectly simple. Uh, it can be done with an individual student and a teacher or with a group of students and a teacher. And you would be amazed how effective it is when it involves precious little more than discussion. Some of you, no doubt, have attended tea groups, blab labs, in which people are there and they don't know quite why they're there and there's some sort of a so-called resource person to disturb them. <laughs> and after a while they get the most incredible emotions and uh, somebody tries to, to, to dominate the discussion of the group, say, and uh, then the group kind of goes into the question of why he's trying to dominate it and so on and so forth. Well, these were the original blab labs. And they have been repeated in modern times with the most startling effects. That is to say, the teacher gradually elicits from his participant students what are their basic premises of life. What is your metaphysic in the sense I'm not using metaphysic in a kind of a spiritual sense. But what are your basic assumptions? What real ideas do you operate on as to what is right and what is wrong, what is the good life and what is not? What arguments are you going to argue strongest? Where do you take your stand? The teacher soon finds this out for each individual concerned, and then he demolishes it. He absolutely takes away that person's compass. And so they start getting very frightened. And say to the teacher, all right, I see now, of course, I, I can't depend on this, but what should I depend on? And unfortunately, the teacher doesn't offer any alternative suggestions, but simply goes on to examine the question, why do you think you have to have something to depend on? Now, this is kept up over quite a period. And the only thing that keeps the students from going insane is the presence of a teacher who seems to be perfectly happy but is not proposing any ideas. <laughs> He's only demolishing them. So we get finally, not quite finally, to the void, the shunya. And what then? When you get to the void, there is an enormous and unbelievable sense of relief. That's nirvana. Phew, as I gave a proper English translation of nirvana. Ah, great. <laughs> so they are liberated, and yet they can't quite say why or what it is that they found out. So they call it the void. But Nagarjuna went on to say, you mustn't cling to the void. You have to void the void. 
And so the void of non-void is the great state, as it were, of Nagarjuna's Buddhism. But you must remember that all that has been voided, all that has been denied, are those concepts in which one has hitherto attempted to pin down what is real. In Zen Buddhist texts they say, you cannot nail a peg into the sky. And so, to be a man of the sky, a man of the void, is also called a man not depending on anything. And when you're not hung on anything, you are the only thing that isn't hung on anything, which is the universe. Which doesn't hang, you see. Where would it hang? It has no, no place to fall on, even though it may be dropping. There will never be the crash of it landing on concrete floor somewhere. <laughs> but the reason for that is that it won't crash below because it doesn't hang above. And so there is a poem in Chinese which speaks of such a person as having above not a tile to cover the head, below not an inch of ground on which to stand. And you see, this which to people like us who are accustomed to rich imageries of the divine, the loving Father in heaven who has laid down the eternal laws, O word of God incarnate, O wisdom from above, O truth unchanged, unchanging, O light of life and love, the wisdom which from the hallowed page, a lantern for our footsteps, shines out from age to age. See, so that's very nice. We feel we know where we are. And that it's all been written down, and that in heaven the Lord God is resplendent with glory, with all the colors of the rainbow, with all the saints and angels around and everything like that. So we, we feel that it is positive. That we've got a real rip-roaring, gutsy religion full of color and so on. But it, it doesn't work that way. Rip-roaring, gutsy religion full of color and so on. But it, it doesn't work that way. The more clear your image of God, the less powerful it is, because you're clinging to it, the more it's an idol. But voiding it completely isn't going to turn it into what you think of as void. What would you think of as void? Being lost in a fog so that it's white all around and you can't see in any direction. Being in the darkness. Or the color of your head as perceived by your eyes. That's probably the best illustration that we would think of as the void. Because it isn't black and it isn't white, it isn't anything. But that's still not the void. Take the lesson from the head. How does your head look to your eyes? Well, I tell you, it looks like what you see out in front of you. Because all that you see out in front of you is how you feel inside your head. So it's the same with this. And so, for this reason, the great sixth patriarch, Huinang, in China, said that it was a great mistake for those who were practicing Buddhist meditation to try to make their minds empty. And a lot of people tried to do that. They sat down and tried to have no thoughts whatever in their minds. And not only no thoughts, but no sense experiences. So they'd close their eyes, they'd plug up their ears, and uh, generally go in for sensory deprivation. Well, sensory deprivation, if you know how to handle it, can be quite interesting. 
it'll have the same sort of results as uh, taking LSD or something like that. And there are special labs made nowadays where you can be sensorily deprived to an amazing degree. But if you're a sort of a, a good yogi, this doesn't bother you at all. It sends some people crazy. But if you dig this world, uh, you can have a marvelous time in a sensory deprivation scene. Also, especially if they get you into a condition of weightlessness. Skin divers going down below uh, a certain number of feet, I don't know exactly how far it is, but get a sense of weightlessness. And at the same time, this deprives them of every sense of responsibility. They become alarmingly happy. And they have been known to simply take off their masks and offer them to a fish. And of course, they then drown. So if you skin dive and you keep, you have to keep your eye on the time, you have to have a water watch or a friend who's got a string attached to you. If you go down that far, and at a certain specific time, you know you have got to get back. However happy you feel, and however much inclined to, uh, say, survival, survival, what the hell's the point of that? <laughs> and this is happening to the men who go out into space. They will increasingly find that they have to have automatic controls to bring them back. Quite aside that they can't change in any way from the spaceship. Now, isn't that interesting? Can you become weightless here? I, I said a little while ago that the person who really accepts transience begins to feel weightless. When Suzuki was asked, what is it like to have experienced Satori? Enlightenment, he said, it's just like ordinary everyday experience, but about two inches off the ground. <laughs> Zhuangzi, the Taoist, said, it is easy enough to stand still. The difficulty is to walk without touching the ground. Mm -hmm. Why do you feel so heavy? It isn't just a matter of gravitation and weight. It is that you are feel that you are carrying your body around. So there is a koan in Zen Buddhism. Who is it that carries this corpse around? And so when you feel it, we, common speech expresses this all the time. Life is a drag. <laughs> I feel I'm just dragging myself around. My body is a burden to me. To whom? To whom? That's the question. You see? And when there is no body left for whom the body can be a burden, the body isn't a burden. But so long as you fight it, it is. So then, when there is no body left to resist the thing that we call change, which is simply another word for life, and when we dispel the illusion that we think our thoughts, instead of being just a stream of thoughts, and that we feel our feelings instead of being just feelings, it's like saying, you know, to feel the feelings is a redundant expression. It's like saying, actually, I hear sounds, for there are no sounds which are not heard. Hearing is sound. Seeing is sight. You don't see sights. Sightseeing is a ridiculous word. You could just say either sighting or seeing, one or the other, but sightseeing is nonsense. So we keep the doubling our words, and this doubling is comparable to oscillation in an electrical system where there's too much feedback, where you remember in the old-fashioned telephone, where the receiver was separate from the, from the mouthpiece, the transmitter. Uh, if you wanted to annoy someone who was abusing you on the telephone, you could make them listen to themselves by putting the receiver to the mouthpiece. But it actually didn't have that effect. It set up oscillation. It started a howl. 
and could be very, very hard on the ears. The same way, if you turn a television camera at the monitor, that is to say, the television set in the studio, the whole thing will start to jiggle. The visual picture will be of oscillation. Da 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 like that. And the same thing happens here. When you get to think that you think your thoughts, the you standing aside the thoughts has the same sort of consequence as seeing double. And then you think, can I observe the thinker thinking the thoughts? Or, I am worried, and I ought not to worry, but because I can't stop worrying, I'm worried because I worry. And you see where that could lead to. It leads to exactly the same situation that happens in the telephone, and that is what we call anxiety, trembling. But this discipline that we're talking about of Nagarjuna's abolishes anxiety because you discover that no amount of anxiety makes any difference to anything that's going to happen. In other words, from the first standpoint, the worst is going to happen. You're all going to die. And don't just put it off in the back of your mind and say, I'll consider that later. <laughs> it's the most important thing to consider now because it enables you, it is the mercy of nature because it's going to enable you to let go and not defend yourself all the time. Waste all the energies in self-defense. So, this doctrine of the void is really the basis of the whole Mahayana movement in Buddhism. It's marvelous. The void, of course, is in Buddhist imagery symbolized by a mirror because a mirror has no color and yet reflects all colors. When this man I talked to you of, Huinang, said that you uh, shouldn't just try to cultivate a blank mind. What he said was this. <coughs> the void, shunyata, is like space. Now space contains everything. The mountains, the oceans, the stars, the good people and the bad people, the plants, the animals, everything. Now, the, the mind in us, the true mind, is like that. You will find that when Buddhists use the word mind, they have several words for mind, but I'm not going into the technicality at the moment. They mean space. See, space is your mind. It's very difficult for us to see that because we think we're in space and look out at it. There are various kinds of space. There's visual space, distance. There is audible space, silence. There is temporal space, as we say, between times. There is musical space, so-called distance between intervals or the intervals between tones rather it's quite a different kind of space than temporal or visual space there's tangible space but all these spaces you see are the mind they are the dimensions of consciousness and so this great space, which every one of us apprehends from a slightly different point of view, in which the universe moves, this is the mind.
so it's represented by a mirror because although the mirror has no color it is for that reason able to receive all the different colors Meister Eckhart said in order to see color my eye has to be free from color so in the same way in order not only to see but also to hear to think to feel you have to have an empty head and the reason why you are not aware of your brain cells unless you're only aware of your brain cells if you get a tumor or something in the brain when it gets sick but in the ordinary way you're totally unconscious of your brain cells they're void and for that reason you see everything else so that's the central principle of the Mahayana and it works in such a way you see that it releases people from the notion that Buddhism is clinging to the void this was very important when Buddhism went into China the Chinese really dug this because Chinese are a very practical people and when they found these Hindu Buddhist monks trying to empty their minds and to sit perfectly still and not to engage in any family activities they were celibates Chinese thought they were crazy why do that and so the Chinese reformed Buddhism and they allowed uh, Buddhist priests to marry and in fact what they especially enjoyed was a sutra that came from India in which a layman who was a wealthy merchant called Vimalakirti out argued all the other disciples of Buddha and of course you know if in these these are these dialectic arguments that are very very intense things if you win the argument everybody else has to be your disciple <laughs> so Vimalakirti the layman won the debate even with Manjusri who is the Bodhisattva of supreme wisdom they all had to see a contest to define the void and all of them gave their definitions finally Manjusri gave his and Vimalakirti was asked then for his definition and he said nothing and so he won the whole argument <laughs> the thunderous silence